morning again. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Eric Sunby. He serves as a member of the board of directors at the Space Force Association or SFA, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to advocating for robust space force to secure space superiority for our future development and exploration. Eric's primary focus and expertise centers on public and commercial space exploration and development with particular interest in the future use of space resources for industrial development from a business and policy perspective. Uh, when he's not driving bipartisan support, he enjoys living at his ranch in the Texas Hill Country with his wife and two dogs. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we can get going here. All right, so uh, again, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's really exciting to be here at Blue Marble Week um, and supporting our uh, strategic space um, sponsorship from SFA. Uh, today, I'm gonna be talking about innovating the forest. That's a really broad title, really broad topic, um, but I'm pretty much going to be going through uh, what I had um, discovered in my master's thesis that I conducted and that I researched uh, at the University of Glasgow in 2018. And from there, I'm going to uh, highlight pretty much how we've, where we are today from what I researched, but also some of the things that I've been working at SFA, some of the uh, outreach and some of the government relations that we've been doing uh, that definitely are going to be helping the Space Force um, flourish in the future. So here you can see, uh, I'm going to briefly talk about this. Um, this is kind of where the Space Force originated from. Uh, most people don't talk about this, but uh, the revolution in military affairs is a military theory uh, that posits that organizational change and technological innovation leads to uh, carrying out a strategy in a more effective manner. And particularly, this was uh, originally theorized by uh, Marshal Nikolai uh, Ogarkov, as you can see on the right of the Soviet Union and all of his um, communistic glory. And in the left, Andrew Marshall, who uh, is more, effect uh, more respectfully named Yoda by his followers, who was the director of the Office of Net Assessment in the Department of Defense from 1973 um, and was there for almost around 40 years, uh, where he really took RMA, the Revolution of Military Affairs, and expanded it. Now in the center, that is Major General Chen Zhao of the People's Liberation Army um, Academy of Military Sciences. And uh, some in, the reason I put him in there was, uh, it's really interesting to note that he took uh, he and others at the Military Academy of Sciences actually took a lot of what Andrew Marshall uh, theorized and, and wrote about and implemented it in Chinese military strategy, particularly in their organization. So the reason I bring this up is in 2016, the Chinese uh, government decided to establish the Strategic Support Force under the People's Liberation Army. The Strategic Support Force doesn't necessarily sound like it deals too much with space, but that's exactly what it deals with. It focuses in cyber and space operations not only that, I think an interesting um, fact is actually the Strategic Support Force is the home for the astronaut corps uh, of the Chinese National Space Agency. So while they do have a civilian agency, um, their astronaut corps reports directly to the Strategic Support Force, uh, which is kind of de facto um, in charge of a lot of the uh, strategies um, dealing in space. So we go on, let's see if this can, there we go. Um, now we move on to the world's first space war. The reason I bring this up is, is simply to kind of set the precedent of where we're going, how the space force comes about. I think this is really important for everyone in the space industry and particularly in the public to really understand how we're getting to, uh, to the creation of a space force and why it exists. Um, some consider the first Gulf War, uh, Operation Desert Storm, to be the first space war. Um, this was when space operations was widely used um, to assist in ground and air operations, and uh, which led to a very low casualty and fatality rate and a rather 
um, quick uh, success in, the, in this operation uh, compared to what had been planned for. Uh, from that in 2000, then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld uh, established the uh, Rumsfeld Commission as a very long name, it was generally the uh, commission to assess the organization and management of national security space. And from that, they actually, one of their conclusions was that a space corps should be established. This again was in 2001 when this was published in about January. Uh, clearly that strategy, that policy recommendation was not able to come to fruition, namely due to 9-11 and our uh, change in attention um, in the Department of Defense. And nevertheless, it's important to note that this idea for the very first time um, from government officials was suggested 20 years ago, uh, not a few years ago, like many um, have, have come to believe. Uh, again, in about 2007, uh, then Senator Wayne Allard of Colorado uh, had an independent review from the Institute of Defense Analyses that uh, again suggested the creation, the establishment of a uh, organization to deal with space operations. They didn't necessarily title it the Space Corps. Nevertheless, um, their language clearly noted that they believed that a military branch should come about in some form or fashion at some point in time. Now, the reason I bring all of that up is really to give a very quick background and overview of how we got to the Space Force. Um, and obviously we have the Space Force, that's why SFA exists, but nevertheless, there are still going to be some challenges that this branch will face. And we at SFA are able to tackle some of those head on and early. Uh, so obviously most people have um, probably seen or uh, heard of Space Force on Netflix. Um, I wanna preface everything that I'm going to say here that this is my personal opinion. This does not represent the views of the Department of Defense. Um, and I can provide uh, sources for all of the um, photographs and information uh, that I have cited on this presentation. Um, so some of the challenges that I actually highlighted during my research in my master's thesis just a few years ago um, have, Pretty, pretty much see, it seems that they've come to uh, fruition over the years and still pertain um, directly to some of the, the issues that the Space Force is dealing with and will continue to deal with in the future. Um, so first, obviously it was created in a system that's highly skeptical of new organizations, uh, kind of straightforward as to why. Um, but more importantly, in my view, I think that next two are a little bit, uh, ha have more importance. So. It was created in a politically polarized environment. I think most of us can agree that that's just a fact. Um, and many in the public, the media and the government don't really fully understand its mission. So the reason I bring this up is because there have been many articles that have been published, generally opinion-based, but nevertheless, sometimes uh, editorials uh, that have been published about the Space Force with misleading information or frankly, completely false information. Um, and that's a, that's a serious problem when we're dealing with the creation and this uh, advancement of our newest military branch, we need as much public support as possible. And we also need our public and our government officials to understand what the Space Force does, why it exists and how it pertains to our daily lives. And that's something that I think uh, everybody on this call, uh, everybody on this, uh, this conference is going to be able to step away from understanding that um, outside of our space bubble, our community of people interested in space, there is a large portion of society that doesn't really understand what we're doing in space and not just militarily, but commercially and, and in our civilian exploration programs. And so, that, in my view, is probably the primary challenge that the Space Force is going to uh, deal with. And it's not something that the Space Force asked for. Um, and it's not going to be something that's going to be too easy to overcome. But it is going to take every, uh, every person possible. It's going to be an all hands on deck kind of um, mission to, uh, to push forward. And that includes all of us. Uh, 
engaging with people who aren't too educated or uh, understanding about space issues is something that really needs to uh, needs to happen in these coming decades as we want to push further into space with our development and our um, advancement that is going to need the full support of our society uh, and not just the handful of people in our in our bubble and i shouldn't say handful i mean there are a lot but compared to the rest of society um, their level of education on space topics is extremely low compared to the people within the space industry itself. Um, and then lastly, uh, distinct culture. The Space Force clearly needs its own culture. Um, it's working on this. It's not something that you can do overnight. Uh, any, any type of criticism I ever have is, is constructive. It's never, um, you know, I, I want to have a robust Space Force, um, but it does need to distinguish itself from the other branches. And there are a few ways that it can do that. Um, there are some opportunities it has had to do that and it has not done so well on. Um, but that's not necessarily their, their lack of uh, leadership or anything like that. They have good leadership. They have the understanding that they need to distinguish themselves. It is just hard going from one organization to another. And that is a challenge that uh, RMA, the Revolution of Military Affairs actually presents to uh, military services and to um, ministries and departments of uh, defense is actually having to reorganize your forces can create its own challenges. Um, but in the end, uh, it's, it's worth all of the uh, trial tribulations you put your organizations through. Um, so clearly today, I'm not really talking too much about the sexy technological um, innovations. Uh, you know, I'm going to give a shout out to a colleague of mine, Matt Anderson. He's going to be talking about some really cool point-to-point -point, um, cargo transport uh, right after this. So please, if, if um, you, you can stick around for that, I know it's going to be an awesome talk. Uh, but nevertheless, these things are really important. As we move forward with this new branch, we need to make sure that uh, the public, but not just the public, ourselves in the industry uh, are able to be good advocates, not just for the Space Force, but for national space policy and for uh, humanity. Um, I, I, for instance, we have the Artemis Accords, and that's something that we, we need to educate people on. Uh, people need to be understanding of why we have these accords, why do we have new organizations, and what are the advancements that we're working towards within the space industry and how it can benefit all of humanity in the long run. Now, this is something that everybody here already knows. Um, so I apologize if I'm beating a dead horse here, but it's something that I think uh, we should all take to heart. And particularly with the Space Force, um, it, given that it has some unique challenges that uh, other entities in the space industry does not, um, it's definitely something that we can all work on uh, to make sure that those both within industry and in the general public uh, are understanding. So that goes on to some of the work that I've been doing here at the Space Force Association, generally with public and government engagement. Um, before I uh, joined the board of directors, I worked very hard um, with a few colleagues of mine uh, in the establishment of the Space Force Caucus, which I'll get to in just a moment. Uh, but before that, I kind of wanted to give just a little plug. I know they've already done this to you today, uh, but the Space Force Association obviously was our first step in getting that public and government engagement uh, with um, the branch and, and supporting its mission in its entirety. And we so we set up in October of 2019, uh, very similar to how the Air Force Association was uh, created shortly before the establishment of the Air Force in 1947. Uh, you can obviously visit us at that link there. Um, but another thing that I would like to point out is the interesting um, development of our launch of the Space Force Journal. Now, the Space Force Gen Journal is an independent uh, journal that transcends political affiliations. Um, and, and it allows to be a medium and a forum for different opinions about how we are able to develop space. And if that's from a diplomatic and information, a military or an economic standpoint, um, that is the premier forum to do so. And so you can read the first publication that came out last week at spaceforcejournal.org. It is free uh, for the whole world to read. And I definitely think that most 
uh, everyone here is going to find some of the articles there to be very interesting. Um, but now I really wanna talk about how we got to the creation of the Space Force Caucus. And that was my primary job over the last year here at uh, the Space Force Association. So um, going back to around March uh, or April, discussions with some of my colleagues, namely Nick Cartwright, who helped me um, uh, day in and day out to, to get this established. We had a lot of discussions about how can we get a lot of bipartisan support for this newest branch. And that's a, that, that was a problem, clearly, because of the political realities of the situation. Um, the branch was becoming a kind of a political football. It was clear that there were some that were more supportive than others. And we needed to make sure that that would not uh, persist over time. So some of the uh, ideas that we came up with were a conference, but very quickly we settled on a caucus. Um, now what a caucus is, is it's an organization within the United States Congress, either within the House or the Senate, they're technically separate caucuses, uh, that are a group of representatives or senators that are interested in a topic, they support an issue, and they want to band together to try to advocate and push for legislation of support um, for that particular issue. We knew that there's the Air Force Caucus, there's a uh, Air Tankers Caucus, um, there, there are many caucuses that are out there. In fact, there's a whiskey caucus as well. Um, and so we thought, why can't there be a Space Force caucus? Um, and I think this is actually a really important endeavor that we undertook because as we come forward to the past few weeks, there's been a lot of news about what is the Biden administration going to do about the Space Force? And to be perfectly honest, it, it's kind of disheartening to see journalists asking that type of question when that, that shows me that they clearly don't understand how Washington even works. And if they're working in Washington, it's concerning to me of what information they're putting out to the public because the Biden administration, no matter what administration is in the White House, they do not have the ability to do away with a military branch. That is a decision that needs to take place under Congress and it needs to be passed through an act. Generally, it goes through the National Defense Authorization Act, which is the establishing document of the Space Force. Um, yes, it was certainly, it can be supported or not supported by an, an administration, which um, not being supported would clearly be an issue because it would uh, politically polarize um, the Department of Defense. But they do not have the ability to do away with or keep. Um, and that was something that I think a lot of people were very confused about. Um, the general public thought that uh, uh, the White House could do away with something like this, um, and that's just not the case. Um, and so what we did was to make sure that we would be able to educate others in Washington, whether that be in the executive branch or the legislative branch, the best thing we could do is to get the strongest bipartisan caucus created as possible. And so as you can see, the House currently is led by Doug Lamborn, Jason Crow, Brian Babin, Michael Waltz, and Charlie Crist. Um, Kendra Horn did sit on the caucus as a co-chair. Uh, she did lose her re-election um, race, and so she is no longer uh, on the leadership of that caucus, obviously. And same thing in the Senate. We have Kirsten Sinema, Kevin Kramer, and Martin Heinrich, and uh, Corey Gardner had led that charge as well, and he uh, as well lost his re-election race. Um, However, uh, I'm very pleased to let everybody know that the House Caucus at least has expanded to over 20 members and seeks to have over 40 members of the House from both parties um, by roughly March or April. And I think that that's a really great achievement that SFA can, uh, can place on our, on our uh, wall, essentially. Um, we did not, I want, I want to stress this, no money was used in this process. It was completely voluntary. We acted as, as simply, uh, you know, an organization that was willing to advocate and, and educate on the topic of why a Space Force caucus is needed and why uh, support uh, needs to be had for a Space Force. So uh, this was not of no um, instance did lobbying take place or anything like that. It's merely what can we do to get the government engaged, both with the public and within itself, to foster that support. There are many members of Congress that have 
said certain things about the Space Force and clearly they're uneducated about the topic. And that is why a, we believed that a caucus would be perfect to have um, to kind of counter that, that negativity, but also educate them on the realities of, of our space operations. And also to work as a medium in which they can communicate with the White House on the importance of uh, space operations and policy. Um, so I put two quotes right there at the bottom. It kind of goes over, uh, it's from, you know, obviously one Democrat and one Republican, one member of the Senate and one member of the House as to why they believed that the Space Force Caucus was a, a important step um, in the right direction uh, for support um, of our newest military branch. So um, that is pretty much my uh, talk today. I wanted to go as quickly as possible. So if anybody does have questions, uh, comments, uh, that, I, that we can have that discussion. I put here at the very end, just a picture of the, uh, the latest National Space Council. Um, the reason I put that there is I think that it is important to have these bodies that are uh, focused on our national space policy. And I would like to see that continue, um, make sure that it's a robust and effective um, council. And uh, nevertheless, um, no matter what we do, space is bipartisan. And it needs full support um, across our, uh, the spectrum from the military uh, to commercial entities and from our civilian agencies. But most importantly, we need the public support, uh, not just for the Space Force, but for space in general, if we are to continue with our development. Eric, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. That's uh, a necessary overview, and uh, certainly, I uh, it echoes many of my my own thoughts. So that's really uh, that's really terrific. Um, uh, I'd like to know a little bit about uh, how receptive were the various members when you reached out to them about the caucus. Um, you know, so, that, that is a kind of a you know, recurring theme within the F Foundation for the Future. That's what they're trying to accomplish. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, how did, how did it go? The, it went perfectly, in all honesty. Um, you know, it, it was funny. We reached out to Cory Gardner's office, and um, by the end of the day, I was speaking to Senator Gardner himself. Um, so they were very receptive of the idea. Um, in fact, uh, to be perfectly honest, there were multiple members of the House kind of rushing to, to get a caucus created at the same time. Good. So, uh, you know, the, the support is there and, and it is bipartisan, regardless of what you read in whatever, uh, you know, news uh, source you're reading. Um, I, I don't want to be too critical of the news media, but in all honesty, they have dropped the ball on this one. Um, and, and I think that that's something that they can do better uh, at, and honestly, they can they can communicate with these uh, with, with these members of Congress more to, to kind of get the word out of really how bipartisan the support is. Uh, on a personal note, uh, I teach at International Space University uh, oh. a couple times a year, and one of my classes, uh, one of my lectures, is about the creation of the Space Force. So I'm going to ask for some of your slides because there are some pieces in there I didn't even know. I knew most of it, but I didn't know all of it. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, my research went a little way back. So um, yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> that was great. But, but that's something when, that we don't discuss much. When, when I when I show this, I actually show uh, President uh, Francis President Macron and his rollout because his rollout of their Space Force is pretty professional. And mm -hmm. our rollout of our Space Force was, let's say, ad-libbed um, in the beginning, right? And I think that that really contributed to a lot of the misunderstanding and the misinterpretation of what this thing is. So uh, I think it's fair that the public doesn't understand. I think yeah. it's fair that um, uh, that Netflix has the trademark on Space Force, right? Yeah. So, so um, I wouldn't deny any of that. I, right. I think that it's just important, you know, from going forward to make sure that we don't 
you know, I mean, you know, I, I'm at dinners sometimes with my, with my family or friends and I can overhear people saying things about yeah. this, I'm not even joking. <laughs> you know, no, the other no, day no. this happened last week. Yeah. And they clearly don't know anything about it. No. And, you know, some people are like, oh, well, they're just, they don't know anything, but that's not the mentality yes. you should have. It should be, how can I make sure they understand what we're doing? Exactly. Uh, part of my conversation with Wolf yesterday, uh, Bill Wolf, one of our sponsors, uh, uh, was exactly that, that, that everybody can point to, in my case, you know, my mom and my dad were in the army, my grandparents were in the uh, Navy and the army. Uh, we all understand the roles and missions of the other forces, but, but Space Force is still somewhat mysterious. Um, yes. So I really love that you're showcasing this. And I, I do think, uh, I have a friend of mine who has said that um, it's a quote, dumpster fire of missed opportunities from both the Space Force and uh, uh, Netflix, right? That they both could have done a lot. To I, I agree. There's a moment in, um, the, and I'm sorry if I interrupted, but no, there's please. a moment in the Space Force Netflix show in which um, General Naird is speaking to Congress. He's being questioned. Mm -hmm. And he's- I love that show. He's not the most uh, uh, communicative individual. And he had to look over to uh, John Malkovich, I forgot yep. His, uh, yep. his, his character's name, um, to kind of say something. And, he gives this great speech. I mean, honestly, he gives a very good speech that is very pro Space Force. I mean, it, it, it explains why we're doing what we're doing and why this isn't some crazy, you know, endeavor to, to you know, put nukes in orbit or something like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I really liked that. And I think that if, if there is possibility, at least in the future for the Space Force and Netflix to work a little bit more closely to kind of say, hey, let's make a comedy out of this, sure. Like, let's make it funny, get people to watch it, but put some stuff in there that really get it across to people as to what we're doing. And that is really good. And I don't mean to take up too much more time, but there was an individual, um, I believe Inara Tabir uh, commented and said, um, if, there, if the Space Force were to sponsor a scouting or ROTC type organization, that was something I was gonna talk about very shortly is one of the ways I think that we can really foster this support um, I was in Air Force Junior ROTC in high school. I learned a lot about how the Air Force operated, what the operations that the Air Force, uh, you know, took part in, and a lot of the history behind aviation. Um, and so I honestly believe wholeheartedly that we need a Space Force Junior ROTC. Um, and and that, I mean, honestly, that's a national security uh, <laughs> endeavor, I think, in my mind, that we need it. And not just to educate people about the Space Force, but to educate people of all economic and social strata about what space means to our species and how we are going to develop space uh, in a peaceful endeavor and how the Space Force actually takes part in that. And so I just wanted to give that last um, you know, kind of recommendation that we can all kind of work towards. Write your congressman, <laughs> you know, do, do what you can to, uh, to advocate for that. A absolutely as a as a former sea cadet that channeled me into the marine corps uh you know those things work those programs matter so thanks a lot eric really appreciate again we want to stress these are your personal comments not an official position of absolutely. the various militaries uh we're going to be making that disclaimer many times over the course of the day we are going to swap over to Jordan and Matt to welcome on Lieutenant Colonel Ladd. I'm out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Eric. And by the way, bundle up. The Arctic blast is coming for us in Texas. I'm, I'm your neighbor in Georgetown here, so we're not too far apart. Yes, it is. It's going to be a, it's going to be an interesting week. Yeah. Thank you all for having me. Absolutely.